even if we are trying to cut off communication, God says, Nineveh, we had for Tarshish, God still sees us. Psalm 139 says that so powerfully that, you know, we can try to leave you, God. We can try to move out of your vicinity, but you're still going to find us. It's clear that God knows Jonah has not gone to Nineveh. Jonah has gone to Tarshish. When the sailors hurled Jonah off the boat, God knows that's happening, right? How do we know? Because the fish, the whale, is there ready to swallow him up, then carry him to safety after a good long time for Jonah to think while he's in there. So if you try to ghost God, you might be able to avoid the conversation, but you'll never be as hidden as a human ghoster wants to be. The first time I led worship after I had shared about my call to ministry, how God got a hold of me, and I'd made this plan to leave my work as a lawyer, which I'd been doing for 15 years, and become a pastor full-time, what I really wanted to do was stand up here, and it was here because I was a lay person in this church when all this happened, so it was in this place that I stood and talked about all this. I almost stood up and said, whatever you do, don't start talking to God. Because that had been my story. Like I had begun praying and listening and paying attention to what God was saying to me. And look where that got me. Everything was turned upside down in my life. I decided that that kind of message wasn't really consistent with sharing about a call to ministry, so I went a different way that Sunday. But my instinct was reinforced this week, my sense that it's kind of fearsome to actually pick up that call from God. Because I saw that same idea in an email that Lucy Elric sent me. Lucy, here with us today, a retired United Methodist clergy person who was married to a, a, a United Methodist clergy person who was also retired by the time I knew them back then. And she gave me permission to share this story with you today. Lucy told me about a woman named Lori. Lori had a dad and a brother who were both pastors. They'd been called into ministry before Lucy knew her. And then Lori married Doug, who was Lucy and Gordon's son. And Gordon, by the time she got connected to Doug, was also a pastor. So he had also been called into ministry. Well then, oh my gosh, Lucy was called into ministry. And you can see Lori is now surrounded by a lot of people who have had that call. And Lucy said after that point, Lori wouldn't let Doug answer the phone in case it were God calling him to ministry. <laughs> it turns out that God didn't call Doug, or at least he didn't answer that call, but their daughter Kaylee did get that call. Go figure. All of this, I think, proving what I thought I should warn you about as I was going down that path. Whatever you do, don't pick up any calls from God. It would have been fair for me to warn you about that. In the terms that I use for today's message, it might look like you've been warned, ghost God and be happy. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, the fact that we're here and praying and talking to you means that we have not, in fact, ghosted you. And somehow many of us whom you have called and all of us whom you have called in various ways, have maintained that conversation across years, across decades. But as we think about what it's like to get that call and to respond the way Jonah did and to know that he's not the only one, we ask that as we ponder all this this morning, the words that I say and the meditations of every one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I'm loving this conversation in this season about how we interact with God when it's God calling. And are we going to pick up when that call comes? Not just the call to like full-time ministry, but the smaller calls that come day after day. So far, we've been hearing from people at places in the Bible where people really did pick up and receive that call and go and do it. Last week, we had a panel discussion with five 
people who really did that, really heard and followed God's call. And if you just read the third chapter of the book of Jonah, where we started, you'd say, oh yeah, Jonah could have been up here with that panel last week. Here's another one who heard and went and did what God had said. If, the, if that third chapter, if the book of Jonah consisted of just that one chapter, it would be pretty inspiring, actually. Jonah goes and he preaches this eight-word sermon warning the people of Nineveh, and to everyone's surprise, they listen. Take it from this preacher. It's always going to be surprising when people listen to what the preacher says. But of course, we don't just have the third chapter of the book of Jonah. We have the rest of the book that puts all of that in a whole different frame. It says the preacher of that eight-word sermon, Jonah, doesn't want the people he's preaching to to listen. He doesn't want the people of Nineveh to do anything. Do you get why? He wants Nineveh to be overthrown. He hates Nineveh, everything they stand for. This thing that God is asking him to do, he's a hard no on it because what God is going to do absent their repentance is exactly the end of the story that Jonah would have wanted. This is why he goes to Tarshish, the opposite direction, even though he's absolutely clear of what God wants him to do. And then he's on that ship, and the storm at sea really confirms what he understood all along, and he knows he's done for. Throw me overboard, he says. I might as well be dead. He says that like a bunch of times in this short book. He's not talking to God through any of this. He's fled the scene, and really he's ghosted God in this whole story, at least that part of it. Do you know ghosting? Again, it's not about ghosts. This term gets used today when someone cuts off all con communication without explanation of what's going on. I thought about what I could have done for the children's time is invite the kids to, be, to come up and talk to me and then be gone for, by the time they got there. I thought that would have been kind of fun. But I wanted to tell the rest of the Jonah story. Ghosting happens in romantic relationships and actually, I think for those of us of a certain age, it's a little inexplicable because a lot of us probably dated someone in our friend group or someone from our hometown. And, you know, ghosting isn't really an option when you're interconnected in that kind of a way. But it becomes more of a possibility when relationships become more remote. So I think the term really rose with the advent of online dating and people being connected really just electronically, where you can simply stop responding. And then what's that other person supposed to do about it? You just, you're kind of done if the communication stops. Another place where ghosting happens is employment. And I can attest every one of the hires that we have made in the last 18 months have had at least one candidate, usually more than one, more than one that has ghosted us. Even after they'd scheduled or rescheduled an actual interview, it hasn't happened to us, but I hear it from others, that people take jobs, actually accept offers, and then don't show up, like ever, and don't really ever talk to the employer about it. And that happens more often than you'd think. I saw a 2018 survey that says 25%, about a quarter of adults, have been ghosted. And 22% admitted that they had ghosted at some point someone else. That's a lot of ghosting going on. If you're on the receiving end of that ghosting, it's kind of a place where you feel a little confused and kind of betrayed, and there's not really any closure to what happened in that relationship. And I got to say, even in those silly kind of early employment conversations where I'd been like in like online conversations with people on the way to an interview, I felt that. And that wasn't nearly as deep as some of the relationships where this kind of thing happens. So in a world where ghosting has become that kind of a thing, when I read Jonah this time around, I thought, oh my gosh, this is Jonah ghosting God. 
So it's like God says to Jonah, he goes, Jonah, Nineveh. Jonah doesn't respond at all, but heads off to Tarshish, disappears. In other places in the Bible, when great figures talk back to, when great figures don't want to do the thing that God is asking them to do, they'll talk back to God. Moses does that. Jeremiah does it. And then there can be some kind of negotiation. But Jonah doesn't say a word. He just goes. It's really ghosting. I wonder if Moses, hearing about that, said, huh, I didn't know that was an option. In this series of weeks when we've been thinking about when it's God, what then, we have to talk about this possibility of not listening, of ignoring God, of ghosting God. And I wonder what you think about that. Is this an option for us? It's pretty lavishly described in the book of Jonah, an instance where someone that God literally called for a particular job totally did that. This ducking of God is laid out in this book of Jonah. And I think it's in the Bible. I think it stayed in this, these, this set of books that we come back to again and again because we've been there. We know something about what it's like to hear God calling us to something that we are not prepared to do. If you haven't been there, it may be that you haven't known God very long or maybe not very well and you haven't maybe quite heard it. But God's people across centuries have had this experience. God starts talking, and we're not always going to like what God says. And then we have to decide what we're going to do with that. In human relationships, it is said that people decide to ghost when it's not really worth it to them to expend the emotional labor of hashing out the relationship. Or they've tried to make it clear that they were not interested or they were done and the other person couldn't really hear it and so they're like, I just, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. Or maybe in a place where it'd be really uncomfortable to say a clear no to that other person. When I think about ghosting God, it seems kind of similar. Maybe we don't feel like we can say no to God we don't know how to get around God's call, so the easiest thing is just to put God on mute, to block God off of our uh, recept receivers. So, they, so we just kind of stop listening, and it's that old thing about talk to the hand because the face isn't listening. We're just not going to, we're not going to hear it. We surely all know people. Some of us have been people who have done that, who used to pray, who used to believe in God, used to talk to God, who would go to church but don't anymore. Ghosting evidently is an option that people choose. But of course it's complicated. So a couple of things I want to say about that. First, even if we are trying to cut off communication. God says, Nineveh, we had for Tarshish. God still sees us. Psalm 139 says that so powerfully that, you know, we can try to leave you, God. We can try to move out of your vicinity, but you're still going to find us. We can go to the farthest limit of the sea and take up residence there, but you're still going to have your hand upon us. We can hide in the darkness, but darkness isn't dark to you. It's just like every other place. There's light around us. It's clear that God knows Jonah has not gone to Nineveh. God, Jonah has gone to Tarshish. So, you know, God could be, you could picture God kind of laughing at Jonah's efforts to evade this call. When the sailors hurl Jonah off the boat, God knows that's happening, right? How do we know? Because the fish, the whale, is there ready to swallow him up and to then carry him to safety after a good long time for Jonah to think while he's in there. So if you try to ghost God, you might be able to avoid the conversation, but you'll never be as hidden as a 
human ghoster wants to be. Second thing, stopping communication doesn't mean that God won't keep calling. It's what I think Jonah figured out while he was in the fish. God could have let him die. God didn't do that. I think he kind of finally says to himself, okay, there's a price to be paid here. And so when he ends up on dry land and God calls him again, this time Jonah goes. I know a pastor who says of his call to ministry, I knew God was calling me, but he was totally opposed, and he left the tradition he'd been raised in, and he came to the United Methodist Church because he had been raised to believe that we were a place that was far from God. Not this church, but the United Methodist Church on the whole. Make of that what you will. But that was what got him to the United Methodist Church. But to his surprise, even in the United Methodist Church, he couldn't escape God's call which is to say, even if we stop responding to God, we try to ghost God, it doesn't mean we're not still going to hear God's call, God's voice, God's invitation. I've heard a lot of people's call stories where they'll say essentially that, I thought I could ignore it, I knew God was calling me, I didn't want to do it, and eventually I finally said yes. But I want to get to this last chapter of the book. Jonah does this thing. He goes to Nineveh. He has this great success, at least in terms of what he says, gets the results that it was intended to. And immediately, Jonah lets God know how angry he is about the whole thing, about God relenting and not destroying Nineveh. I'd rather die, Jonah says to God, than live with you showing mercy to those people. This is really extreme. If it feels like a really shocking reaction to you, I do want you to pause for a minute and get in touch with the places where you would react that way, where you have said things like that. Think of that person who hurt you so deeply that you've said to them, maybe not to them directly, but you've said, thought about them, you're going to burn in hell. And you're admittedly kind of glad about it. You may not have that person, you may not have that person in your own life that you'd say that about, but I'm pretty certain someone that you know feels that way. There's probably that public figure that you said or thought If there's any justice, you're going to die for what you've done. And you may not have that person in your life that you'd say that about, but I guarantee you there's someone in your life who does. Maybe it's that nation that we've been at war with or that religion that you're certain is wrong or that, I don't know, fill in the blank that you say ought to be wiped off the face of the earth and it can't happen too soon. I'll say it again, you may not have that situation in your mind that you'd say that about, but someone you know does. That's the energy Jonah has when he rails at God. That's the kind of certainty Jonah is carrying when he looks at those people of Nineveh and despises them. So Jonah leaves. He sits down opposite Nineveh, He's going to watch what becomes of the city. Really, he's sulking because he knows now nothing is going to happen to the city. And there's that business about the bush that God sends to grow and give shade to Jonah and then sends a worm to attack it right away and the sun and the wind so hot that Jonah again asks to die. And then the book ends. And I don't know if you noticed, it doesn't end with a simple moral lesson, not a direct rebuke to Jonah for this whole attitude that he's spouted back at God all through this book. Jonah ends with a question, an open-ended question that God puts before Jonah. And I think we can understand it more fully with this translation that's closer to kind of the original Hebrew phrasing. And then the letters on the, the, along the one side are kind of, they indicate the parallelism between what God says about Jonah and what God says about God. So this is God speaking to Jonah. You you pitied that plant, which you didn't plant and you did not cause to be great, 
which became a child in the night and perished, like overnight, perished overnight that quickly. And I, by God, shall I not pity Nineveh, this great city that has more than 120 humans who don't know between their right hand and their left, they can't figure anything out, and animals... The book of Jonah doesn't answer this question. It ends this way. You could say that Jonah ghosts all of us because he doesn't answer it. Like, there's no recorded answer from Jonah. But as we've seen, ghosting is only partial. And we who have journeyed with Jonah through this story begin to get the point. We are Jonah. Jonah or us, we are invited to answer this question and perhaps begin to question our own certainties that might sometimes lead us want to want to ghost God or to die because of what God has done. What's your answer? Do you want a merciful God? 